Hi everyone, welcome back to Business is Personal. I'm Dr. Corey and with me today are Miriam and Steven. And we are talking about sustainability. So if, before we begin, if you would just take 30 seconds and introduce yourselves and uh, where you work and your interest in sustainability in business. Miriam? All right. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Mariam Farag, and I lead on the corporate responsibility and social impact for NBC Group, which is the leading um, uh, media conglomerate in the region, Middle East uh, Broadcasting Center. Um, I'm big on women empowerment. I'm big on youth development and sustainable development goals within the region. I'm also a mother, so the SDGs really speak to me. Okay. Uh, my name's Stephen King and I'm a lecturer in media at uh, Middlesex University, Dubai. I'm also a member of our Institute of Sustainable Development. Uh, I've been teaching and advocating the SDGs in Europe, here in the Middle East uh, and internationally since 2015. I'm currently a Teach SDGs Ambassador and as of last year as a Climate Reality Leader as well. Um, I'm really grateful to have the opportunity to talk to you today. Thank you for being with me. So when we're talking to leaders, business leaders about uh, sustainability, we're talking about the sustainability goals, the UN Global Compact, these, their hunger, poverty, inequality, uh, climate change, the oceans. We're talking about stewarding the entire earth and all of the people that are in it. What are the most important, what do you think are the most important things that we need to address right away? Um, <laughs> Stephen. Pollution. I'm going to start with uh, pollution. The more that we produce and the more that we consume creates significant waste and that waste never goes away. Mm -hmm. uh, and so if you want to look at the very first thing we need to deal with is how we are uh, getting, uh, how we are correctly disposing of all of the items that uh, we use on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. and that's got to be number one. It's damaging our oceans. Uh, it, you can walk along the streets and you can see the wildlife uh, having uh, being problematic. Uh, th there are there are countless uh, memes and videos on Instagram and stories yeah. showing this this happening. So I think the number one is 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 being more responsible for our personal production and the waste that it produces. Sure. Now, in my house, Steve, I've got, I've got straws that are hashtag I'm not plastic, mm. right? That's my house. But I'm not militantly opposed to single-use plastics, probably like I should be. Mm. Uh, as a business leader, how do I, how do I bring that, uh, non, that uh, anti-pollution stance into what we're doing in a, in a business setting? Let's, let me reframe it, okay? So if we say that, the, that only 100 companies on the planet are producing about 71% of all of the, the carbon pollution in the air, mm. uh, and I'm not on that list of 100 companies, uh, how, much, how much benefit can it really be for me to start steering my company in, in the direction of, of anti-pollution? Okay, so you have to, uh, in parts of the world there is a concept of polluter pays. Uh -huh. so there's a form of government taxation uh, where you have to pay for whatever uh, waste that you produce, especially yeah, in yeah. terms of electronic waste. And so from a business perspective, those countries uh, and those op countries op companies operating in those countries have to take into account and in reducing the amount of waste because it's a business expense on them. Sure. But also there is a responsibility from a packaging point of view mm. to make sure that what you are presenting to your customer reflects your brand values. Right, sure. And if you are a premium product or a premium brand, it is more ex it is expected now <laughs> that you are more concerned with more than just money yeah. and that your logo is more than just a, an image to it to capture people's attention yeah. you have to have a meaning for your business yeah so from that is that is that is the driver i believe those are two drivers for for it either government regulation or uh, an appreciation and respect for your own brand that you're trying to build yeah it's, i i ordered a lunch the other day from a takeout place that served the most opulent kind of uh, packaging. It was it was a box with little boxes in it and cutlery that looked like it could be multi-use cutlery and multi-use dishes in that and it was just the most unsustainable thing for a takeout mm. and I, I, I felt embarrassed that I had ordered the, and I probably won't ever order from them again because the packaging was just so so over the top. It communicated to me a value that I don't align to. Mm. So I, I hear you on that. And there are actually organizations here in the UE, Azraq Middle East, they just organized yeah. uh, a campaign whereby useless cutlery <laughs> was taken to uh, Freedom Pizza, I think it was, yeah. and they made it into artwork. <laughs> so they wow. took these uh, boxes and these spoons yeah, that yeah. were delivered and uh, effectively it's a shame 
kind of activity yeah, yeah. Uh, and then to re help raise awareness to consumers to say vote with your card and ask for uh, mm. a green edition. And I've seen that on talabat.com where right. you can pick and even those restaurants that ignored that initially and didn't take it take that into effect are are now not sending the additional yeah. cutlery they're taking the instruction seriously because they're getting a lot of complaints. Right. So shame art aside, Miriam. Yeah. What is the big issue for you, <laughs> and how can we how can we address it as business? I leaders? mean, uh, I, I you know I have a few, but on that note, in fact, my my son, my twelve year old son, the other day said, "Mommy, there is um, there is a new straw. It's a non plastic straw, and uh, I want to order it on Amazon." And mm. I said, "Okay, what is it?" And he said, "You know, it's just portable. You take it everywhere with you because we're no longer going to be using plastic straw." Mm. And I think what's happening is that not only brands are getting uh, more aware, yeah. it's um, the, the young generation is getting more aware and mm. they're actually educating the parents. Mm. You know, they're educating me. They're talking about turtles and, and how to save the planet and um, do more uh, beach cleanups. And, and, you know, we have to recycle more. So I honestly think as well, the school plays a huge role. So education, you know, yeah, plays a huge role when it comes to the SDGs, any SDG. But at the same time, it's, it's them, what the student or what the young person takes with with them home mm -hmm. because a lot of parents coming from you know an older generation don't really get that yeah, you know sure. so definitely brands have to walk the talk and and I'm I'm seeing a few of them in um, in Dubai oh, are actually you know starting no plastic bags yeah. and so it's it's you know it's catching up but for for me and for the company that I represent it's a number of SDGs, mm. but um, you know, poverty is one of them. Sure. Um, unemployment. Yeah. Um, the unemployment rates in in the region are horrific. Mm. Uh, we are one of the highest unemployment rates in the world. Um, the youth, you know, they graduate, they don't have jobs, they become hopeless, and then they go to you know uh, very bad routes. Right. Um, peace and security, which is goal sixteen, is yeah. is is really important because if we cannot have peace and security. Mm -hmm. We can't have everything and we can't have anything. The brands cannot even function. We won't be able to make money. Um, I mean, everything is just going to go down the drain. Um, as well as economic um, inequality. Sure. Yeah, so access to jobs, access mm -hmm. to um, equal pay, sure. uh, gender diversity, gender equality. So all these you know, um, issues and all mm -hmm. these challenges really matter to this region mostly sure. and to the brand that I present because we, uh, we're the media. Right, sure. So uh, we represent the voice of people and we have to give, uh, you know, responsible um, information and responsible right. content in order to right. uh, mirror uh, what the consumer really wants and what, you know, what viewers really want. So is there proactivity at NBC in terms Absolutely. of providing that kind of content Absolutely. to make sure that we're trumpeting? These are our oceans. These are this is our climate. These are our this is our culture. One hundred percent. values. Okay. Yeah. So I, I really don't want to brag much, but I am very <laughs> proud of, um, of, you know, I'm, I'm proud to be part of this, you know, entity or part of this group. Um, mm -hmm. um, since, since it was founded in 1991 in London, in fact, before it came to the region, it, it, it you know, NBC has always been a responsible media mm -hmm. uh, conglomerate uh, from the beginning of time. I mean, and it, it really, it stems from the founder and the chairman, yeah. um, which is Sheikh Walid Al Ibrahim, who was actually a big philanthropist. So they were doing bits here and bits there mm -hmm. and trying to really cater to uh, the viewer because it's a family channel. So everything that we do has to be family-like. Yeah. Even the movies that we put on, um, sure. you know, they have to be censored, uh, certain scenes, certain languages in order for me to be able as a parent to say, you know what, you can watch NBC2 because the movies are um, appropriate for right, sure. uh, a family living room. Um, but then, you know, over the years, the content has developed. Mm -hmm. And nowadays, we're seeing a huge change in the region. Mm -hmm. And um, things that we care about, uh, matters that we really need to address, yeah, uh, sure. such as gender equality. And in Saudi particularly, in the past two years, we have seen a change in, in perceptions and a change in the community. Yeah, sure. We really need to reflect that when it comes to media. Mm -hmm. So um, changing the narrative when it comes to women, addressing women's issues. Right. Um, not in the sense that we take men's issues away, but we're trying to address inequality. We're trying right. to address freedom right. um, and you know women's roles when it comes to economic development. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I'm totally with you. A lot of organizations are struggling with that. I think, Steve, we had a discussion uh, earlier that 
uh, local women, Emirati women, are, are seeing that less and less as a struggle because 54% of, of uh, university graduates in engineering, mathematics, and technology are now women in the UAE. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have incredible female empowered leaders in the government in the UAE. Yeah. We're not seeing that kind of leadership yet reflected in the private sector, but the government is setting, some, uh, setting a, a great bar in terms of women's empowerment and equality. So when I, when I deal with this strategy in, in the private sector, uh, I'm typically addressing things like uh, uh, gender parity in terms of pay and, uh, and rights parity in terms of paternity leave, yeah. right? So if we make that, those two as, as the, the first benchmarks, what are the next benchmarks in terms of gender equality in the workplace and private sector? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It, it's, um, I'm sorry, Stephen, I'm going go, 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 to steal your thunder now. No, but no, in please, terms of gender parity, and this is a discussion that I was having um, last week with some colleagues. Um, mm. The problem is that it's not just the company actually offering um, paternity leave. Mm. It's the person changing their culture and their background actually taking advantage of the paternity oh, leave. Yeah, that's right. They're basically thinking, why do I need the paternity leave? I don't want it. I don't sure. need it. Sure. It's a mother's job. So it, it mm. really, again, goes back to changing the narrative mm. and changing perceptions and misperceptions, in fact, that we've sure. been having for years. It's not really right or wrong. It's just right. a matter of this is what I grew up with. This is what my parents and grandparents mm -hmm. did. How can we now change it in a way where our children understand that right. when my son is you know, a father, mm -hmm. I need to take paternity leave. Yeah. Um, but it goes hand in hand with the business, in fact. Yep. Uh, yeah, but you know, Stephen, as a man. <laughs> as a man, I, okay, as a, I think that is very good. Thank you for that, that tip saying, we need to listen more. Mm. As men, we need to listen. Yeah. And we need to continue to listen. We've listened so much and we have achieved uh, some ground on, on what women have asked for mm -hmm. and the next step is to listen more mm -hmm. that's basically all I'm gonna inject into that <laughs> I think if we listen and and act I think that is the best thing that we can do in that sure I for me yeah, the most absolutely. effective thing the most effective thing that I've seen is actually closing the gender pay gap yeah that's it so if you take, for example, aviation, which was one of our major industries in the UAE, I won't use the UAE as an example, but globally speaking, the number of female pilots is about 5% of the, of the whole, right? It's more than double that in India. It's 12 and percent of the, of the pilots in India are female because they closed the gender pay gap. Mm. That's it. The government just decided that all female pilots get paid the same as all male pilots. Therefore, uh, women have decided that, oh, it's a, it's a safe place to do the same amount of work and get the same amount of pay. And so the number of women pilots in, in Indian airlines, among all the airlines, is actually much higher than the global average. So I think that for me is, is low hanging fruit. You just I think the law closed was that passed gap. Uh, last year yeah. here in the UAE to make gender uh, pay was, yes. Uh, yes. is now, is now uh, mandatory. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Um, and there are in the PR and advertising, because we're media mm -hmm. people, yeah. the PR industry still has a staggering gap mm. between men and women and how mm. they're paid. Yeah. But the bodies that the powers that be the industry trade bodies are taking steps to again to name and shame yep. uh, to yeah, say yeah. that this is this is where the, the problems lie Good. and so it's those are awareness buildings uh, which perhaps go beyond what the government can enforce yeah sure uh, self-regulation industry self-regulation uh, is, is something which uh, is, is going to help drive that forward excellent yeah exactly so executives out there if there's gender pay gap in your organization it is illegal stop it absolutely uh, uh, the next one, I think, uh, probably for me, my heart is in poverty and hunger. And I know that it's, I, I've heard the narrative that it's not going to matter how many poor people we have if nobody can survive on the planet, and so climate change needs to be number one. Uh, I agree, climate change is a massive topic. I want to address that, especially where pollution is concerned. But I want, uh, uh, for me, my passion is, is poverty and hunger. I see just too much of it, and it is absolutely ridiculous to me that we're still addressing poverty and hunger as realities when you know, we've, we've got 50 years of addressing poverty and hunger as realities. Why, why, are, we, why are we struggling so much to, to solve this problem? Well, um, I'm going to go. Go ahead. Because we, ha we just had a campaign called Feed Their Dreams. And yeah. uh, we are, um, you know, really championing when it comes to partnership and Goal 17. We, we have been trying so hard, like we said earlier, uh, to empower people who are actually doing the job but can't reach more people. Mm. So um, our partners is the UN World Food Program, uh, yeah. which is 
you know, an organization that has been struggling for years mm -hmm. uh, to to manage, you know, ending hunger. Yeah. Uh, by 2030, we know that we need to, you know, um, decrease uh, hunger percentages and so on. Mm -hmm. But we have noticed um, with every campaign is that it's not just really that lack of resources, mm -hmm. it's more of the distribution of resources. Yeah, sure. There is a lack yeah, of sure. distribution of resources when it comes to the global, there's enough food for everyone. It's just that, you know, some countries have more and some countries have less. Yeah. Um, and that goes hand in hand with poverty yep. um, and equal opportunity when it comes to jobs yeah, and, yeah. and economic lack of economic development. Yeah. Um, so we were focusing more on the campaign of trying to link it uh, on an emotional mm -hmm. way to, to speak to the viewer. Yeah. Because as you know, sometimes, you know, the viewer sees many, many numbers, you know, so people are dying here and, you know, there's floods there and hunger there. And, you know, there's an emotional fatigue when it comes to the numbers. Absolutely, but when yeah. you link it to a child's dream. <laughs> That's great. So I you like speak that. to everyone. So That's it's right. not feed them, yeah. it's feed their dreams. Because a child, when they are two or three or five, yeah. if they are hungry at night, yeah. they will not dream of becoming a scientist or a doctor or right. a media person or you know wh whatever they want to be. They will yeah. dream of a loaf of bread. Yeah. They will dream of a sandwich. Uh, they cannot focus at school. So mm -hmm. malnutrition is huge. Mm -hmm. So if we, I believe, as, as a business and as media and as academia and, uh, and PR and so on, mm -hmm. if we link the growth of children yeah. and the lack of growth of children when it comes to physical and mental yeah, sure. and hope, yeah. you know, lack of hope in the region, lack of hope in the global uh, arena to poverty, to yeah. hunger. Um, I think we can speak a lot to businesses, sure. you know, because again, you know, we're, we're trying to think of business here. How does it make business sense if yeah. we don't have um, people who are actually, you know, if we don't have employed people yeah. and if we we have more poor people than um, you know privileged people. Yeah, sure. We won't be able to sell brands, yeah, and therefore exactly. you won't be able to get advertising. Uh, you won't be ha you won't have many students. I will not get advertising as a media company, and therefore the market is going to go down. So actually, it makes perfect business sense for us to develop the economy from within. Yeah from deep down yeah, yeah. and try to bring them up to at least, you know, mid-level. Yeah, exactly. Because people now exactly. are living b below the poverty line, way below yeah, the poverty absolutely, line. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I find business leaders are, are fatigued with trying to figure out what to do in terms of philanthropy. So where do they address their funds? Do they give it to the World Food Program? Do they give it to the Red Crescent? I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to come back into this and it'll, then I'll drink it into that uh, question as well. I think you have to be careful with poverty in the sense that you have to define what it is you're trying to do. Sure. Because to address poverty, yeah. one of the solutions is let's build tons of factories, mm -hmm. let's give tons of people minimum wage jobs, yep. we've solved poverty. Right. And this is what's happening with sustainable tourism. Mm. All right. So the sustainable tourism, we think, yeah. when you hear that great word, ecotourism, yeah, yeah. going to visit the forest. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. how sustainable tourism is actually measured is in mm. growth in GNI, mm -hmm. number of jobs created. Yeah, sure. So it's not valuated on climate action or on pollution right. or on the negative impacts, right. but it helps to solve poverty. Sure. So in the realm of sustainable development, you have to have the, uh, the triple bottom line. Yeah, of course, of course. Yeah. So you have to handle poverty in hand with the social benefits mm -hmm. and with the environmental benefits. Yeah, it sure. cannot be taken on its own because to solve it, no poverty just means economic, uncontrolled economic growth. Yeah, sure. That's just how the, I think we've fixed sure, or sure. achieved the Millennium Development Goal in 2015 mm -hmm. was by the growth, general growth in profit in the GNI of India and China. Right. And as we mentioned, China's carbon emissions have gone right, quite sure. significant. So yes, poverty has been reduced, but the planet a better place? Mm -hmm. Maybe, debatable, right? Now, I've been trying to put out the hunger uh, fire in, in Yemen, personally. I lived there for five years, so I've seen abject poverty, and I've seen incredibly hungry people. And even still, I'm not, I'm not able to travel back there. It's not safe for foreigners, but I'm still chairing a, a non-government organization that operates there, and mm. we deal specifically with hunger. And our, for us, our 
net profit at the end of the year is how little we spend in uh, general and administrative expenses. Mm -hmm. So we try to keep our GNA uh, below 10% and to make sure that more than 90% of whatever comes in is ending up on the ground. And I think that's the kind of bottom line that we need to start looking at in terms of uh, poverty relief and hunger relief is what, what percentage of your income is GNA. Mm -hmm. And if we're looking for, for organizations that actually are, are much more efficient, then we'll find organizations with very low GNA. So I'm going to come back yeah. into that again because uh, the UK has just delivered its uh, voluntary national review at the, at the UN just this week and the, the one positive aspect perhaps that came out of it was we uh, as the British people donate 0.7% yeah. of our GNI to foreign aid programs of right. aid. Mm. Mabruk. Right. What else are we doing? Okay. And that was a question which was raised and no one pr pretty much unable to, to, to answer in any particular way. Right, sure. So it, the focus on how much money you give out yeah, yeah. is a false flag for the sincerity of the organization towards sustainable right, sure. development. It is just giving some money to appease your conscience. Right, sure. It has to be within the fabric, the moral fabric of yeah. the organization yeah, yeah. for it to really count. I agree. Because you can stop the donation of overnight. Yeah, absolutely. And then what? Yeah. And, it, and no. that has happened before. Of course. Yeah. So for, for so many countries, including Egypt, where yeah, I come yeah. from, uh, foreign aid just stopped overnight. Sure. So what do, we, what do you do? Um, and you discontinue projects that are happening on ground, mm -hmm. which means thousands of people get discontinued aid. Yes. So it's the donations versus social um, uh, sustainable impact or investment impact. Right. And this is really what we are trying to, or me, you know, I try as much as I can to work with the NGOs that I'm working with and yeah. say, look, donations are not sustainable. Right. You cannot live forever on donations. You're struggling year in, year out, yeah. trying to make ends meet, yeah. you know, just for employees. Imagine the people that you're actually, you know, trying to help. So um, social enterprises, you know, uh, exactly. impact investment. So if the companies want to really give a hand and try to help out with sustainable economic development, yeah. they need to say, OK, you know what? We're going to start using freelancers in Palestine because they don't have jobs and they cannot yeah. they don't have access to economic jobs. They can't leave the country. Economically, way. the country is not working well. So yeah. let's you know, if I'm a Dubai based company, I will work with freelancers for graphic design, yeah for web design, for whatever it is that you can do remotely. Absolutely. So that's one. So even for Yemen and any country, you know, Sudan is, is suffering now. Yeah, so sure. any country that's suffering has talent, let's use them. So that's one. I'm going to work with companies that are small, medium enterprises and less focusing on the multinationals, the big names, the big brands that, mm -hmm. that are coming from privileged countries. So really focusing on the local ecosystem yep. a lot of startups are coming up yep. a lot of businesses and what happens is that it's very sad that some of the big companies come in and they're like i'm gonna grab this and i'm gonna buy it mm -hmm. so we don't want local companies to be bought Right. We want mm. local companies to be sustainable yeah, sure. because they are the ones who are going to create the jobs mm. yeah. and make things happen on a local level. Yeah. So less globalization, more localization if you want. There's one you other know? thing as well as donations which stop. Yeah. Bottom up initiatives. Mm. So you can have this fantastic idea where you have this very innovative and inventive yeah. uh, middle-level marketing manager yeah, who sure, knows sure. about Fiverr.com or Nabesh.com, it's Pramont Nabesh, right? Yeah. yeah. Local, uh, <laughs> that goes out there and recruits from the region. And that yep. person leaves, suddenly the initiative stops. That's right. It's got to be top-down and led yeah, right. from totally the most important people in the company, whether that's the owners, the chair, mm -hmm. and the top C-suite also has to own those same values. Yep because it's too easy to evaluate a company's performance on economics mm -hmm. and every company has blips. Yep. And when uh, that blip happens, the top man can find him, or popular woman, yep. might find himself or herself ousted uh, because of that one period of, of blips Absolutely. and someone takes over and changes the direction altogether. So the entire C-suite has yep. got to own these, uh, these values. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So or letting go of the people like me and you. <laughs> you know, so that it, it's true. Yeah. So the so social yeah. impact and mm. the PR are the first people that are let go. 
Right, sure. It's true. When yes. you know, when 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 things go bad financially, they cut down on the ones that are actually doing marketing for social good. Right, sure. and that's another thing. You know, if you're listening, CEOs, please don't <laughs> do that. <laughs> it's not right. <laughs> it's not right Keep to cut the people in. that are marketing your yeah. and doing the PR for your social enterprises. Also, a very quick tip for profit for a profitable business is to support local SMEs and to support uh, uh, digital freelancers from emerging or impoverished nations. That is an amazing tip. You can save money by supporting freelancers in other nations that are doing less, less uh, uh, that are not doing as well as we are economically. So this is an amazing, those are great, great tips. I wanna move also into climate change and, uh, and circle back to pollution, which is where we started with you, Stephen. Mm. So, okay, climate change. As a, as a business owner, how concerned should I be and what can I do? Dep it depends on the size of the business if you're go and if you're going to be international and where your supply chain comes from. Sure. Um, one of the biggest problems that has uh, hit businesses and made climate change such a business issue mm -hmm. is the impact in East Asia and Southeast Asia right. where a lot of garments or um, raw materials are produced yeah. and tsunamis, droughts, mm -hmm. floods, all of this uh, significantly disrupts uh, supply chains. Right. So as horrible as it sounds, the reason for so many companies getting involved in climate change is from a business uh, continuity right. reason than it is for a perhaps a moral ethical viewpoint mm. for the future. So you're saying that it's actually sustainable business? They have to I'm be. It's, of course well. it's sustainable. But I mean like they're, they're, it's enlightened self-interest is what I'm saying. Yes, exactly. Okay. So the numbers make sense for them to be involved it's in. Billions, billions of dollars are lost because of these uh, crises that happen in, in this part of the world. And the, um, you also have to look at the cost of insurance sure. and certain properties as well. So uh, for, uh, for, for uh, importing and exporting uh, products from different parts of the world, the, the costs will significantly rise unless you're, you're interested in these particular yeah. issues. What can you do about it? Mm. Um, there is quick and easy ways, they'll find alternative suppliers. Right. That doesn't necessarily affect climate change, it does right, mitigate right. the impact on it. Yeah. Um, how they sh should be looking at it is they should be engaging with their stakeholders, finding out what can be done yeah. within their community and what their community actually asks for them here and there and now. Yeah. And that includes their staff, their staff's family, their customers, right, shareholders sure. and what have you. Uh, and then finding out the material actions that they can undertake. Right. Because there's hundreds of things that you can do. Yeah, sure. But there's all probably only three or four that they need to do as an organization mm -hmm. which will have a significant impact and they can focus on. Sure. And then they need to implement it uh, with uh, smart goals with yep. a very mm -hmm. clearly defined outcome yeah sure uh, and uh, put the resources behind it and not be afraid to fail yeah that's right that's because right that is uh, a real big problem if you try something put your name out against one of these yeah and you don't succeed the first time or the second time yeah, yeah. you will have people who will be saying uh, campaigning against you from within or outside the organization yeah if people are buying from you and they're trusting your brand they're also trusting that your brand is reflecting uh, those kind of sustainability values mm. and I, I have a friend who manufactures garments for Walmart uh, she owns a um, uh, a plant in Egypt mm. actually and she says that their sustainability audits are really quite in depth and so there are major conglomerates that have done the work to make sure that their their supplies are are um, yeah. are clean, not clean, but I mean better, better for the planet, better for the people that follow the triple bottom line approach, yeah. right? So it can be done, and can it be done on an SME scale though? Uh, there are many businesses which are. Uh, I'm going to give a big plug to Washman. Washman. It's a dry cleaning and delivery firm. They launched uh, many years after everyone else. Okay. But they launched with a campaign saying, for one dirham, we'll take your plastic recycling. Huh. Plastic and paper, put it in a bag and we'll take it with us. Interesting. And Fantastic used them ever since. Wow. That's and lovely. So, you know, they obviously bring clothes with plastic, but you can then send it back. Yeah. And they will help you reduce your waste. Yeah. yeah so yeah. as a small and medium business, that is a great opportunity for them to move forward. Um, you look at the body shop in the past where it did yep. its fair trade, Lush. 
today with its uh, vegan friendly mm -hmm. products. Um, so from an SME, it is a business opportunity for you to differentiate products sure. in terms of Lush to actually charge a premium for your product yeah, sure. and get a strong brand uh, and uh, build loyalty mm. with customers that in, in one particular market are, in, if it's dry cleaning, you'd be yeah, saying, sure. like, I'll go with this guy or this guy or this lady or this lady or this firm and decide uh, whoever's most convenient and who's cheaper. But with the Washman's off brewing, you go, okay, fine. Now, they have something okay. which is a commitment. I want to raise a little bit of caution there only because I, I, I hear in the market there's a bit of sustainability fatigue in terms of trusting companies to actually do what they're saying mm. they're going to do, right? We all know what greenwashing looks like. Mm. And I'm not going to accuse Volkswagen mm. of greenwashing their mm. brand and then totally betraying their consumers, mm. but that's how it felt to a good deal of their, their customers is that they greenwashed the brand and then they betrayed them. But they produced false figures. Yes, that's right. And they, they, that was not necessary. That was actually a deliberate attempt to that's right. It was uh, obfuscate. Yeah. Yes, of course. So now when we have those kinds of examples globally on, on a massive scale like Volkswagen, I don't mean to pick on them because there's a lot of companies out there that have done this. But how do we trust when a company that's large, that has a history of behaving badly, like 3M, has replaced their annual uh, financial reports with what they call the sustainability report. They rewrote their vision, their mission, their values yeah. to reflect sustainability, environmental sustainability specifically, yeah. in their products and their services and their manufacturing. How do we trust those companies when they do that and, and not look at them and say, oh, they've just greenwashed and, you know, I mean, we've all got post-it notes in our house. We're probably going to keep buying them. But uh, where does that trust come from when we've got big examples of big failures? So there are some guidelines. I'm doing a thesis on my own basis. Sure. So there are lots of these reports. And one of the biggest challenge with these reports is they are so thick. Mm. They're 300, 400 pages long. Yeah. And that is the, f for me, is the first watch out. Mm. If you have got a document which is so big, they are, it is too comprehensive, too holistic. They haven't, they haven't tailored it for their audience. That's maybe why you, we maybe, don't do it. Maybe, you're in the, maybe you've accessed the wrong document, <laughs> yeah. but there should be a consumer-friendly site mm. which explains what they're doing. Right. Mm. And you need to be able to judge from that whether the statements are accurate, mm -hmm. whether the claims are correct. Yep. Uh, the resource uses the best evidence yep. as well as industry best practice. Yeah. So there's lots of things. Global Reporting Initiative, ISO 26000. You have the UN uh, Global Compact Communications on Progress. Are they using these industry best practices yep. which are recognized or are they inventing their own? Right. Uh, are the arguments they give justified by the data that they present? Yeah. Uh, the text. Does it reflect the genuine intention of the organization? Sure. So for example, if you have a cigarette company, that's saying we're going to promote electronic cigarettes now because mm. they are healthier. Yep. Do we believe is that? Do we think that's going to be really what the cigarette company is trying to do? Right. So you can actually see whether that statement is is, is genuine. Is the text misleading? Uh, does it fit within the context of that industry? Yeah. And finally, and most importantly, is it clearly written? and easy to understand. I like that a lot. I think we should just start by adding a sustainability infographic to the back of our financial reports. Yeah. For every for every SME out there, just add a sustainability infographic to the back of your financial report every year and defend it, yeah. right? Put something there that you're proud of. At least be honorable and truthful and be proud of three or four great statistics for your company. Then at least you can hold your head up, right? Yeah. And there's a, there's a great, um, study that was done by two academics, Locke and Seal, yep. which I'll send you the link for. Yeah, um, sure. And they have uh, four different uh, aspects, which include many of these points and more. That's great. To help, to help you to determine whether your report has the required credibility. Yeah, so if you're, if you're looking for a star uh, starting place, Locke and Seal, we'll get that, that link and we'll put it up down there. Uh, and also the UN Global 10 Compact, like follow those those principles, they're there for a reason and they give a great set of guidelines for business owners. And you can also, uh, you can subscribe to a, um, a newsletter that comes in on email that'll let you know what the UN 10 are doing and where, where the big case studies are and, and where the, the best practices are coming out of. So that's also a really good starting place. Anything I else on climate change? I Karen? would like, uh, no, it's not really climate change or pollution or anything, but on the sustainability long reports that, sure. you know, everybody loves to do and they hire consultants and they pay so much money um, for a report that honestly I never read. Well, greenwashing so, is expensive, Mary. Yeah, it is very <laughs> expensive. So instead of doing that, companies should actually focus on two simple things, internal and external. Okay. 
It's, it's very simple and that's the way we do it. If you're going to do sustainability and social impact, you yeah. need to first sell it internally to your employees and sure. your staff. So you really need to walk the talk. You start mm -hmm. from within first. So you look at your processes and your uh, human resources policies and so on and see how do you treat your own people yeah, sure. before looking out. How do you actually treat your own home? This yeah, is sure, your home. Sure. So um, for your staff to believe you, to actually understand that they belong to a company, whether big or small, mm -hmm. thousands of uh, employees or five, yeah. that they belong to a company that actually cares about people, genuinely cares about people. It's yeah. not taking the box of a report yeah. or it's not just doing that for propaganda. Right. They actually start with you first. Maternity, yeah. paternity, everything that we've mentioned, yeah. but also going above and beyond, having the employees own the corporate responsibility and social impact. They mm -hmm. own it, they feel it. It's not just Mariam or Steven just doing X, Y, Z in the corner. Everybody owns that. Externally, you yeah. really need to also walk the talk in terms of sustainable impact. Yeah. Yeah. How are you really changing the economy or the ecosystem within? Who are you investing in? Yeah. Which right. companies? Um, which uh, NGOs, where? Yeah. Is it only where your market makes sense? Or is it, you know, um, inclusive? Mm -hmm. um, having to really address certain issues. And actually, at the end of the day, there's a, a big tip of, you know, the iceberg where does it make sense to you? Mm -hmm. So instead of company X doing everything on the table, you choose what makes sense to you as a business. Right. So oil and gas, media, um, FMCG, uh, whatever it is, yeah. the industry that you're in, you really need to um, just stick true to your business. Right. And leave everything else to everybody else. Right. So instead of uh, you know going through the limelight of what's what's in fashion these days, is it entrepreneurship? Sure, sure. Is it hunger? Okay, let me do that for a bit. Right. And then I'll change to the next best, right. you know, next best thing. So it's just really, you know, it's very, it's simple. And stop those reports. Yeah. yeah. Stop them. Just focus on your impact, impact, impact. How many people are you impacting yeah. internally, externally? That's your KPI. Forget the rest. That's great. Sorry. But no, really, I just don't believe in reports. I believe in KPIs. I believe in communicating your results yeah. and testimonials from human beings. So yeah. instead of B2B, B2C, it's just human to human, H to H. Keep it simple. Mm -hmm. What do your people think of your company and your yeah. social impact on as a whole? And what do others externally think of you? Yeah. Let them speak for you yeah. and just play as the underdog. That's really great. Steven, last thought? Um, there are, th th talking about reports, we'll finish your reports, there's good data for good, data for average, yep. and data for bad. Right. Data for bad is when you just produce uh, reports for your press releases and for your publicity. Mm -hmm. It means nothing to do with the business. Data for average is you take uh, the, be the cheapest information available and you try to apply it to your business to try to do a, a, some form of effort in improving the sustainability of your business. Yeah. But data for good is when you actually look at the methodologies that are required to find the best quality information, which will help you create better decisions so that you can really take the full opportunities yeah. of uh, sustainable development that, they, that, that, it's, that is going to come. That's excellent. Yeah, and so leaders, my final tip is ask the moral questions. Make sure that you're talking to your executives and your staff and asking them the real, are we ethical? Are we moral? Are we proud of the work that we do, the products that we produce and the services that we produce, where we produce them and how we produce them? Can we be proud of this? And then listen to your kids. Parents out there, your kids are being uh, educated about the SDGs and about the, uh, the state of the environment, the state of people, and they are much more aware than you think. So listen to them. When they have a cause, make that your family cause and then maybe that'll leak its way back into your organization. Thank you guys so much for, uh, for being with me. This is a huge topic. So it's been a real privilege. Thank Pleasure. you. Thank you very Thank much. You.